is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering the life and lives of Christopher Chant by Diana Wynne Jones. In these chapters, so the last section ended with Christopher Chant getting impaled on somebody's spear. And then he wakes up this time and it seems like he's fine. And I'm like, oh, cool. I guess if he gets hurt there, it doesn't count. But guess what? It seems like it does count. And I'm very anxious now. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Uh, thank you very much to Patricia for commissioning this episode. Patricia has, was one of my first like consistent commissioners, and um, she has been recently having a little bit of trouble because there are other people now that are starting to get involved with uh, placing commissions, and she's been messaging like, I can't get another slot. Um, so I'm glad that she was able to get this and she's gotten some others later on because I really, really enjoy this book a lot. And um, this is one of those things where I always say that there isn't anything that I have been asked to cover for Spoil Me that I have disliked. That hasn't happened. I'm very lucky with that. But there have been things that, while really good, are also very heavy, Uh Speaking of which, I'm going to be covering the Obelisk Gate later today. There are things which, while fun, are really, really tricky to keep track of because there are so many moving parts, like The Witcher. Um, and then there are things like this that are really lighthearted. And while there are certainly like serious themes mixed in, the story itself feels in a lot of ways, sort of old fashioned and because of that familiar. So this is almost like comfort food, if that makes sense. Um, and if any of you guys have been, you know, sort of wanting to find something that gives you this feeling, um, I would really recommend something that I got for free on audible, um, called Wishes and Wellingtons. I'm going to make sure that I have the author's name right. But it is a similar like feel. And I devoured it. It was not a very long audiobook. I think it was like six hours long. And it has a similar vibe to this as well. And I'm realizing that this is just a nice, like, this is a nice break for me to read this and feel like I'm getting a taste of something like dessert almost. Um, does that make sense? So anyway, I just wanted to thank Patricia again for commissioning this because I'm really into it. Um, so this section, like I reread a little bit of the previous section just to remind myself exactly what happened and to refresh any of you guys, uh, Christopher had made a deal with a goddess sort of stand in that he met in a, uh, temple, in the other world that he went to that if she would allow him to take a cat back with him, that he would come back and bring her a bunch of books. Excuse me. And this section begins right after he is caught running out of the temple with a cat in a basket. And one of the temple guards throws a spear through his chest. So he wakes up having come out of this like, dream travel state astral projection is sort of what I think of it as but astral projection is when your body doesn't leave and your spirit does which is really a lot more what his friend is doing um 
And he seems to actually leave because later on, when he gets sort of jerked back into reality, he falls into his bed in like the most literal possible way. It is genuinely like his whole body goes with him. And that's why he's able to pick things up and move stuff around and take things back with him when nobody else is really able to do that. So he comes back to himself after getting stabbed in the chest and he looks down and there is nothing wrong. He doesn't have any sort of injury. There's nothing going on. that's like uh, even making it seem like this was anything more than a dream at this point. And he lets Throgmorton, the cat, out of the basket because Throgmorton is very irritated at being left to uh, sit in this basket and, and stew there. And Throgmorton is walking around, exploring the room. And this happens a little while later, which is really interesting to me. Christopher falls asleep again for a bit. And then he wakes up and Throgmorton is still like wandering around. And Throgmorton climbs up. And this is such a real thing that it was like horrifying, but also like made me laugh. Throgmorton climbs up on this fucking... Uh, curtain rod and like yanks it down and in doing this it slides towards Christopher and goes through his chest like a harpoon like the spear did when he was in the, it's like the exact same spot and I can't tell you how much more alarming this was to me than the spear going through him. I think there's a combination of reasons there. The spear, it's like you are still sort of clinging to the fact that this isn't his world and maybe it doesn't count. So there's that sort of to reassure yourself, even though you're not totally positive that's even true, you can sort of hope for the best on that. But also there's something about like being injured in this really dramatic way where I would think this would kill him, right? Um, except that he winds up being discovered by somebody who has magic. So they were able to save him. I'm not sure if I would expect him to live through this if he wasn't attended by somebody with magic. This feels like a pretty brutal fucking... But it doesn't like go through his heart, I don't think. I'm not totally sure. I'm going to read this to you. Um the end furthest from Throgmorton and nearest Christopher came loose and plunged down like a harpoon with the curtains rattling along it and Throgmorton hanging on frantically for an instant. Christopher had Throgmorton's terror stricken eyes glaring into his own as Throgmorton rode the pole down. Then the brass end hit the middle of Christopher's chest. It went in like a spear. Um, the last thing Christopher saw for the time being was the last governess in her white nightdress, gray with horror, moving her hands in quick, peculiar gestures and gabbling very odd words. So we don't really get like a super detailed description of exactly where he's hit by this, but she comes across him fast enough that I tend to think he would have died if this, if she had not been around to step in. Um, so, Oh, by the way, Wishes and Wellington's author is Julie Berry. Sorry, I was uh, searching for that and then totally forgot and just looked down and realized. Um, so Uncle Ralph comes in and in what I think is now unsurprising fashion, because I got the feeling right out of the gate that Uncle Ralph was kind of a shit, but this is like, I'm a little bit surprised in some ways that he's as willing to be as open about what a shit he is in this scene, because he really just seems to think that either Christopher doesn't get it, like Christopher, either that Christopher won't care, or maybe thinking Christopher can't hear him, or he thinks that Christopher is just too dense to really like put together exactly how he views his nephew. But he is very shameless about treating Christopher's injury that almost killed him as an inconvenience to his plans and something that just like is 
It needs to be dealt with, but if we can just get it over with quickly. And he's not worried about the kid for the sake of his own safety. He's worried about the kid because he's a piece of this like tool set that he is putting together that obviously involves a lot of other like really there's there's other people involved and he mentions that that like their plans are going to have to get put postponed because of this injury and also he's planning on fucking taking throgmorton apart he's gonna kill this cat and not just like butcher it he's going to like dissemble it and sell each of the parts of it and the the cat as a whole is like pretty much priceless um it turns out like just its eyes are going to get such a fortune several hundred pounds i think he says um and his mother meanwhile is doing the bare minimum to like make sure that her son is okay hearing that he was and everything has already been taken care of by the governess by this point but then his dad comes in and his this moment is so sad because the way it's written, um, he heard brisk, heavy feet approaching the door. He sat up at once, wondering what he was going to say to Uncle Ralph. But the man who came in was not Uncle Ralph. He was a total stranger. No, it was Papa. Christopher recognized the black whiskers. Papa's face was fairly familiar, too, because it was quite like his own, except for the whiskers and a solemn, anxious look. Christopher was astonished because he had somehow thought, without anyone ever having exactly said so, that Papa had left the house in disgrace after whatever went wrong with the money. So he sees his father so infrequently and is just so not used to this man being a part of his life at all. That when he comes in to check on his son, his own son doesn't recognize him and it doesn't even occur to him that his parents are going to take any interest in what happened. And this is like, frankly, brutal, you know, it, it, not recognizing your own parent because they're so uninvolved. The the closest thing that I can think of that I've heard about in this with this happening is like Owen going to a grocery store and he passed his mother and she didn't recognize him. And I don't remember whether he decided to like point out who he was to her or if he just let it go because he didn't really want to have that conversation. But it's not that this is so far outside of the realm of reality is my point. Um which like, I feel like a lot of people who have not seen this kind of neglect of a child would think that this was a little over the top, the idea that you just don't recognize them. But I promise it isn't. It's very real. Um, so his father has a very specific question. Uh, the life spell I had for you showed, in fact, it stopped as if you were, um, frankly, I thought you might be dead. Christopher was more astonished still. Oh, no, I'm feeling much better now, he said. Thank God for that, said Papa. I must have made an error setting the spell. It seems a habit with me just now. But I've drawn up your horoscope, too, and checked it several times. And I must warn you, the next year and a half will be a time of acute danger for you, my son. You must be very careful. Yes, said Christopher. I will. He meant it. He could see the curtain rod coming down if he shut his eyes, and he had to keep trying not to think at all of the way the spear had stuck out of him. And then his dad says that brother of your mama's, Ralph Argent, I hear he's managing your mama's affairs. Try to have as little to do with him as you can, my son. He is not a nice person to know. And having said that, Papa patted Christopher's shoulder and hurried away. This last bit, Christopher was quite relieved. One way and another, Papa had made him very uncomfortable. Now he was even more worried about what he would say to Uncle Ralph. So I was glad of this because it seems like, I won't say exactly that Christopher is realizing exactly who Uncle Ralph really is because he's still going on and doing the things Ralph asks of him later on. But it feels a lot more like he is wary of Ralph in a way that he wasn't before, in a way that's very intelligent. You know, like you, he had the absolute trust of a child who is desperate for attention from somebody. 
and who wants someone to take any sort of interest. And I like the fact that this incident seems to have chilled that a little bit for him. Um, to his great relief, the last governess told him that Uncle Ralph was not coming. He, uh, he said that he was too annoyed about losing Throgmorton to make a good sick visitor. Oh, right. I forgot to mention this part. So he, the governess has been ordered to put a kind of like, uh, un, like a spell on the room to make it so that Throgmorton and I would assume Christopher as well are not able to leave the room. But Christopher is able to break the spell really, really easily. And and this is a question for to me of whether or not the spell was just not cast very well, or if it's just that he ta- happens to be a lot more talented than he realizes. And him breaking that spell is actually kind of a big deal. And maybe he just doesn't know that it's kind of a big deal that he was able to do that. Um, but nobody else is aware that he broke it. They just know that Throgmorton's gone. So it could be that because it is a temple cat, it has powers of its own and it was able to get out. So either way, he's sort of in the clear at the moment. Um, and it becomes more and more clear as he goes off to school that he is just so unaware of what he could potentially be capable of. Um, So Christopher tries to sort of milk the time that he has in the sick bed because he's feeling a little bit weird about this, this whole traveling thing. And he decides that when they ask him to go on another experiment, that as long as he isn't going back to the place where he was fucking killed, basically, essentially that it'll be okay. So he goes out and meets up with Tacroy. Tacroy, Tacroy, Tacroy. I'm going to call him Tacroy. Um, series ten is the one in which he was murdered, um, but they go to series nine this next this next time, and Tacroy is uh, really like beating himself up over Christopher being k- killed. Basically, he really thinks that he could have done something, and Christopher is made uncomfortable by this fact. And and I don't think he tells him exactly what happened. Um, the The thing is that it's just like, okay, so he, he says to him, um, are you really all right? And Christopher says to him, fine, my chest was smooth when I woke up and doesn't explain to him what happened with Throckmorton. So to Tacroy, I would assume he's having the assumption at this point there's no harm coming to him if this if these injuries happen in these other universes, which is not actually the case. And it seems because of the way that I'm I'm not getting from that moment, there's nothing saying that like Christopher was feeling guilty for keeping anything else from him. It's not like Christopher's like, he decided not to mention the curtain rod. It's there's no hint to me that Christopher has put it together that the curtain rod happened because whatever happened in the other world is having a sort of like equal reaction in his own world. It seems like he really views those as two entirely separate incidents, which I absolutely do not right like of course not so i guess it's going to take another incident like this for them to really figure out what's happening and i'm not looking forward to it i don't like this part of the experiment the figuring out that he's actually like in danger of dying genuinely dying perhaps if we're to remember what happened in um charmed life where you know, there are boys with multiple lives. He has to be somebody with multiple lives and he's over here just wasting them because he just doesn't understand that they're being spent. He doesn't know anything about this. Um, And I wonder if his uncle knows and just doesn't give a shit because in Charmed Life, it turns out that uh, Kat's sister was 100% aware that he had multiple lives and 
she wasn't just like, oh, I'll just spend your extras because at least you'll still be fine in the end. It came down to, I'm going to spend all of them and just kill you because those extra lives are even better than me just killing you the one time. I get to get so much power from killing you several times, which is just so horrifying. And I really want her, his uncle to not be as terrible as Gwendolyn was, but I'm thinking maybe he is. Um, so they had, his uncle has created this sort of like sled kind of thing. And it took probably some pretty intricate magic because it's existing in this world. And also it's possible to pull it out of that world back into their own. So they go to this place where there's all of these women. Um, and it says a group of thick armed silent women were waiting with packages carefully wrapped in oiled silk. Um, and I'm really curious about what's in those. It says the packages smelled odd, but by that, but that smell was drowned by the thick garlic breath from the women. So I'm really curious what's in these packages that he's collecting. Like, I just really want to know. And they, these women try and pile the things on the sled and they just fall right through. It has to be Christopher who does it. This stuff isn't coming through otherwise. So, um, yeah, I'm really interested in finding out all about the various bits of commerce that his uncle seems to be doing based on the stuff that he's getting from other worlds. And if people know where it's coming from, like, are they aware that he's using his nephew to get to this stuff? Is he like bragging about having this sort of contact? Or is he keeping Christopher totally secret from everybody? I feel like if you're his uncle, if you're this type of guy, you're going to keep it secret, right? Like, you're going to want to make sure that you're the only one that has any possible line on it and that nobody's going to come at your nephew and make him a better offer for his time and energy than you are. But I feel like this is going to have to come out eventually. Um, so Tecroy is asking him whether or not he's like learning any magic and Christopher seems genuinely surprised by this question. And it's like, no, I, what do you mean? No. And Takroy is like, okay, you have a ton of talent. Like what you're able to do is some strong magic. So you really need to get into getting some lessons. Like you talk, talk to your mother, do whatever you need to do. And Christopher says, I think mama wants me to be a missionary. Takroy screwed his eyes up over that. Are you sure? Might you have misheard her? Wouldn't the word be magician? No, said Christopher. She says I'm to go into society. Ah, oh, society, Takroy panted wistfully. I have dreams of myself in society, looking handsome in a velvet suit and surrounded by young ladies playing harps. I like Takroy a lot. Um... So he says, try again. Your uncle tells me you're going away to school soon. If it's any kind of decent school, they should teach magic as an extra. Promise me that you'll ask to be allowed to take it. All right, said Christopher. And Christopher, at this point, has not been around other kids of his age. He has been really isolated. So the idea of school for him is frankly terrifying. And I really remember this sort of vibe. Like, being an only child for me dealing with other kids was very nerve wracking. Um, it, it, I just tended to be extremely quiet as a child and sort of observe people. And I think that's what has led to me doing as well with like the psychology of characters that I'm reading about is all of that time as a child, just watching people and sort of sensing the reality behind the things that they said or what they were actually saying based on the expression on their faces and whatnot. Like I just tended to be better at that stuff, I think, because I wasn't engaged in the usual way. I had to find another way to do it and connect with people, even if those people were not aware that I was doing it. Um, so Christopher's fear here is really justified. And 
I love the fact that he winds up making friends really quickly because I was a little concerned that it was going to be so awkward for him that he'd wind up sort of like a Neville Longbottom where he's got no real like handle on himself. And it's not that he's not good at anything. It's just that he doesn't have any confidence. And he is also like, uh, so like make such a goofball out of himself that it gives the impression that he's bad at things when really he's not. He just needs some people to have like some faith in him. But it turns out that on the train on the way to school, he meets a couple of other kids and one of them is just as nervous as he is. And then the other kid is actually, you know, kind of cool and collected and they all hit it off famously and become this like really uh, tight knot of friends. So I was very happy about that because you know, Christopher just doesn't have a lot in his life. And it would be such a shame if being neglected as a child continued on into his time at school and he wasn't able to connect with anybody there either. But that's the nice thing about making friends when you are somebody who doesn't have family that acknowledges you or takes care of you the way that they should. You can, to a degree, and it's by no means a replacement, but you can find some of that with friends. And it's not going to be exactly the same, but it's going to be something that lets you know that there are people out there that you can count on, that you can connect with, that people don't treat you this way because you are simply unworthy. It's because of them. And that may take a long time to actually sink in, you know, decades probably, but it's the start. And there are a lot of people that I personally know whose families were just disappointing and they wound up making it and, and coping with that by creating a new family for themselves out of friends. And that's just a beautiful thing that we are even able to do that. You know, I just really think that it's a privilege that we may not always know the value of sometimes. Um, so he is able to, bring this whole sled of parcels back. And Uncle Ralph is just delighted with the way that this went so flawlessly. Um, from then on, Uncle Ralph arranged a new experiment every week. Um, and at this point, like at first, they, they aren't sure how long the magic is going to hold on this sled thing that they're using. So the first time he wants to go and explore, but they just like head straight back with the sled full of packages because it's not really, they're not sure that the sled is actually going to stay solid enough, even with Christopher there to bring everything back in time. But then once they realize that it worked, they put a stronger spell on it that will hold for several hours so they can pile everything onto the sled and then go off and explore and then bring it back at the end. And, Oh, Excuse me, goodness. Um, and Christopher, it's so weird. I, I hate when I yawn like that because it really makes it sound like I'm like barely staying awake. But I mean, I said at the beginning of this how much I enjoyed this. So I, that has no reflection on my enjoyment, I swear. Um, but to Croy, basically, it turns out is having just as much fun exploring everything as Christopher is. It's not like to Croy is just doing this to sort of humor Christopher because he feels bad that Christopher's working so hard and not really getting anything out of it for himself. It seems like to Croy is just as interested in checking all of these different places out. And so they get some really interesting, um, like ex exploration in here. I'm going to read this part. Um, let's see. In series one, they went and looked at the amazing ring trains, where the rings were on pylons high above the ground and miles apart, and the trains went hurtling through them with a noise like the sky tearing without even touching the rings. In series two, they wandered a maze of bridges over a tangle of rivers and looked down at giant eels resting their chins on sandbars, while even stranger creatures grunted and stirred in the mud under the bridges. Christopher suspected that Tacroy enjoyed exploring as much as he did. He was always cheerful during this part. It makes a change from sloping ceilings and peeling walls. I don't get out of London very much, Tacroy confessed. 
This is better than a bank holiday at Brighton any day. Almost as good as afternoon cricket. I wish I could afford to get away more. And Christopher is asking, like, if he lost all his money. And to Croy is like, dude, I never had money to lose. Like, I was an orphan that somebody found. Um, and he is really resistant because basically Christopher is uh, trying to make a friend here. And he feels like Tacroy is enough of a friend in these other universes that they should be able to like know each other in person. And I agree, but Tacroy is very, it's a combination of things here. He seems like he's embarrassed about the fact that he is poor and living in a bad area or whatever, but there's, I feel like there's also something that he's hiding and I don't really know what that could be, but he tells Christopher that to Croy is only my spirit name because Christopher basically is like, well, I could just go to the area of London you're in and yell your name until somebody tells me where you are. And to Croy's like, no, you couldn't because that's, this is not my actual name. And I can't help but wonder if there's something else going on that he doesn't want. Christopher to see like is it possible that Tacroy doesn't look anything like this in person and he's like somebody that Christopher knows or is it just I don't I don't know I really don't but there's something that feels like more than just the embarrassment of being poor so yeah it's um I don't know kind of distracting me a little bit I just want to know about it and finally, okay, so it's time to go to school. He gets so worried and he makes friends right away on the bus and every or on the train, sorry, and everything is going really well. Um, before the end of the first week, Christopher was wondering what he had been so frightened of. School had its drawbacks, of course, like its food and some of the masters and quite a few of the older boys. But those were nothing beside the sheer fun of being with a lot of boys your own age and having two real friends of your own. Christopher discovered that you dealt with obnoxious masters and most older boys the way you dealt with governesses. You quite politely told them the truth in the way they wanted to hear it so that they thought they had won and left you in peace. Um, after less than three days, he had learned enough without quite knowing how to realize that mama had never intended him to be a missionary at all. This made him feel a bit of a fool, but he did not let it bother him. When he thought of mama, he thought much more kindly of her and threw himself into school with complete enjoyment. So this is really interesting to me. M what is it? that makes him realize that she had never really intended him to be a missionary. Like, and maybe this is, maybe there's something that she said towards the beginning of the book that at this point, because it's been a while, I have forgotten that I meant that I even noticed at the time. But right now, all I can remember is him like being told about the various dull things that he would do. And, I want to know what it is that she that he thinks now that she intended or if he has a reason to think that she was lying um, in order to, like, fool somebody else, maybe. And I'm just very unsure of that. And also, I should mention, before he winds up going to school, he is taken to get braces. He's brought to the dentist. Dentist is like, your teeth are fucked up, son. And they put metal braces in. And it's an interesting little, like, because we know from uh, Charmed Life that contact with metal makes it so that your magic doesn't work. Certain kinds of metal, I think, was the thing. Uh, it might have been silver or steel. In any case, I completely forgot about that aspect of it. I mean... It just didn't like enter my head. And so when he goes to school and he's taking magic classes, he doesn't seem to have any talent for it at all. And then he like goes, he's supposed to meet to Croy on October 8th, but he's like so distracted when his governess tells him October 8th that he 
completely forgets and he goes all the way into November without once ever traveling and meeting up with Jacroy until he gets a letter from his uncle who is just like basically what the fuck dude there's been no like communication from you at all if you can't do this anymore then just tell me but I would appreciate you letting me know what the hell is going on and Christopher gets really guilty not because of letting down Uncle Ralph which is what I had expected but because he realizes that he made a deal with that goddess to get her some books in exchange for taking this cat. And she held up his, her end of the bargain and he totally, totally bailed on his. And I love the fact that that's the part that he feels guilty about. Like, that's exactly the kind of reaction that I would have. And I am I feel like it's a really good sign that he doesn't feel bad because he let down Uncle Ralph. I feel like that shows him starting to he's still doing this stuff for uncle ralph because he's like getting paid for it essentially it's not consistent pay he should be charging a lot more but he isn't as worried about that as he would have been months and months ago so i feel like that's a really positive sign and i love the fact that like to him welching on a deal is just really inexcusable it's something to be ashamed of. Like, even if you, he says something like, even if she was only a girl. So apparently like making a deal with boys is meant to be a bigger deal. But even if it is a girl, you really should follow through on it. Um, just to be polite. Okay. So he decides that the first thing that he is going to do is get some books together and go and make good on his part of the bargain that he made with her, which I just was so pleased that that, is like his priority here. Um, and when he tries to travel the first time, it doesn't work at all. And he can't figure it out. He lays awake half the night trying to travel and nothing is happening. And when he comes down to breakfast the next day, the headmistress sees him and is like, oh, yeah, you have circles under your eyes. I know exactly what's going on. You can't sleep because of those braces, huh? And it's clearly something that she's like dealt with before. And she makes him sort of surrender his braces to her. And then his magic starts to work again. We have not yet since the, the braces have been taken off. We have not yet seen anything about changes in performance in the magic class that he's been in, assigned to. But I would imagine that is on its way, that it's going to start to reveal itself. Now, I'm not sure how much the braces are gone because it seems like the deal that they made was that he would take the braces out when he was sleeping because he couldn't sleep but he was allowed to put them back on during the day so i feel like there's got to be something that leads to him not have maybe he forgets to put them back on during the day or something and then he realizes that his magic works but christopher isn't really great at putting two and two together so even if he does forget to put his braces in and he his magic works all of a sudden, I'm not confident that he's going to realize that the braces are the thing that was like making it difficult for him or impossible for him. So we'll see how long it takes for him to catch up on that. Maybe somebody will mention magic being hindered by metal. I don't know how many people are even aware of that, you know, but um, I would think that that would be something pretty basic that the, the teacher would have known um, but then you'd think that he would have been like, well, you've got metal in your mouth, kids. So that's probably why this isn't working. Um, I don't know. I wonder how common knowledge that is or if it is at all. I would think it would have to be common knowledge because there are so many metal objects in the world that there's no way people haven't run across this until now. Right. Like he can't be the very first person with magical ability to also be given braces or to, you know, try and do a spell while touching metal which suddenly ruins it i feel like this should be common knowledge but i guess we'll find out um so he gets his friend who has a sister to come with him to the bookshop and pick out some books that he thinks girls would like and one of the books that they pick up is a thousand and one nights which looks awesome but it also looks a lot like the world that the goddess lives in already and so he's sort of like all right i do want to get this book but i'm not going to give this to her because i feel like this isn't going to be interesting at all but his uh friend points out a series 
called uh, the Millie books. And it's all about this one girl. And it says Millie goes to school. Millie of Lowood House. Millie plays the game. He picked up one called Millie's Finest Hour. Um, another moral and uplifting story about your favorite schoolgirl. You will weep with Millie, rejoice with Millie, and meet all your friends from Lowood House School again. Does your sister really like these? Wallows in them. She reads them over and over again and cries every time. I have to, like, my my immediate association is Anne of Green Gables, is what I'm thinking of, you know? I mean... I'm sure that there is another series that Diana Wynne Jones was sort of thinking of and had in mind when she wrote this. I don't know what it is, but I kept thinking of Anne of Green Gables and it's the sort of like Anne of Green Gables can certainly be rather saccharine at times. And there are definitely like moralities within those stories that now seem terribly like improper and out of date and, and just, generally sending a bad message based on what we understand now. But uh, they have aged surprisingly well, and they would certainly make you cry. I mean, there's definitely several moments that reading them as an adult, I was just like, okay, this is killing me a little bit. Um, but they, this is a much bigger series, because these five books are only the first and there's apparently like a whole other set of five, maybe even more. He isn't even sure. So he brings these to the uh, the goddess and because he's able to travel this time around. And he, oh, no, wait, that's right. The first time is this is when it doesn't work and he starts to get really worried, but he manages to... Uh, to do it eventually once the matron notices that he hasn't been sleeping. Um, so he gets there and it's been such a long time since he's done this. And he has sort of like learned so much in other ways about the world that his experience crossing into this like sort of nether world is actually a lot scarier for him than it was before. It's just there's a lot more to be frightened of as you get older and understand better what dangers there are in ordinary things happening. When you're a kid, it's just am amazing how many ways in which adults will stop you and tell you to be careful about stuff that you know perfectly well you're not going to do. They're like, be careful. That's right on the edge of the table. And you're like, I know it's on the edge of the table. I can see that. It's fine. Whereas as an adult, you have watched, you know, seven or eight lovely crystal glasses get smashed because things were on the edge of the table. But as a little kid, you're like, I know where that table is. I know where the glass is. Stop. It's fine. You know, just like you don't have the experience to inform things. And so the fear is just not there the same way, which is a gift in a lot of ways. But he is starting to be on the other side of things. And so... This whole area looks alien to begin with, even though it used to be so familiar to him. And that is the part of the things that got highlighted. Um, he, let's see, Christopher found he was still afraid, except now he was afraid of someone pointing at him and shouting, there's the thief that stole the temple cat. He kept feeling that spear thudding into his chest. He began to get annoyed with himself. It was as if school had taught him how to be frightened. You know? Like, those are some true words, motherfuckers. It really does. And like, I don't, th there, it's easy to look at that and be like, well, that's a bad thing. But being afraid is a like really important part of staying alive. You need to be afraid at times in order to get yourself out of a super dangerous situation. So I don't like to make it sound like, oh, everything, you're just afraid of everything now. And isn't that useless? Because no, it's got a very specific use, actually. Um but it's certainly inconvenient when you don't have any choice about something and you have to push yourself into it anyway. And, you know, at one time or another, you wouldn't have had to push yourself at all. You would have just done it. And it probably would have felt easier because you weren't afraid in the first place. Um, so he gets in there and the goddess is there and is so delighted to see him. She just figured 
at this point, it's been months. I don't know if time passes the same way there as it does for him. But she says that she just thought he wouldn't show up. Like it, she had given up hope on that. Um, so he opens the package and she sees that there's five books. And he knows very well that Throgmorton is an extremely valuable cat and that the price of the books that he got her is in no way proportion proportionate to what that cat is worth. So he is feeling like he's sort of ripping her off a little bit. And he proposes coming back with more books at a later point, which he does. Um, and when he asks her if she liked the first set, she is obsessed with them. She loves them. So he brings the um, next set of books and he thinks that like she offers him uh, an arm bracelet because she thinks that he's doing too much for her. And he tries to be like, look, no, I'm giving you these books, not because I want to be nice to you. And I'm not just doing this like out of generosity. I am trying to get us even because I feel like we aren't, you know, and she insists that he take it anyway. So he reaches out to t to take it. And the moment that he touches it, he just bounces back into his own bed. And it's very loud. Everybody is just like, what the fuck was that sound? And he has to just be like, oh, I was having a nightmare, which I would really love to know what he says he did in his sleep to cause that noise. But it's apparently dark and nobody can even tell. Um. So as this is all being uh, like going on, there's also in the background, the obsession of all of his like dorm mates with the Thousand and One Nights stories, the Arabian Nights. Um, and I can't help but wonder because there's a moment where it says he was deep into a confusing set of people who were called calendars. Fenning made everyone groan by suggesting they got their name from living in the part of the world where dates grew. <sighs> that is just such a bad joke. And Christopher dropped off to sleep. So I can't help but wonder if there's something about the Arabian Nights, because it gets mentioned so many times that they're reading this, that I should be like connecting a little bit with this story happening right now. But I'm not. So if anybody's listening to this and it's just like, I can't believe you don't see the line that she's drawing to connect these things. I'm sorry. Just like, let me know. Okay. Um, so he finally goes and sees um, to Croy for the first time since he's moved down because he went and saw the goddess and, and made good on his promise to her before ever going and seeing to Croy. And he sees him and is just like, hey, I'm really sorry like, you must be pretty mad at me for leaving you hanging all this time. Because when he comes across to Croy, the dude is waiting with this sort of expression on his face. Like, he is expecting to just sit there for nothing for a long time. Um, but to Croy is just like, dude, I'm getting paid to just show up. So if you don't come, it's like boring, but I'm still getting paid. It's fine. This is my job. So don't worry about it. Um, and he asks Christopher whether or not he's been enjoying school and that that's probably been so distracting for him that he has been like having way too much fun to even think about coming here. And is generally so like understanding and everything about the whole situation that Christopher feels even more guilty about it. And he says to Croy says something about how like, you probably don't even want to do this anymore. And Christopher's like, yeah, I do, even though he really doesn't. And to Croy can tell that he really does it and is, is trying to like, offer him an out. Um, but he says, if you really want to go on, your uncle is sending the carriage to series six next Thursday. You do want to go on? Really? You don't have to, you know? Yes, but I will, Christopher said. See you next Thursday. Um, so the longest parts were the weekly magic lessons. Climbing across the place between to meet to Croy the first Thursday, Christopher still felt quite frightened, but it made a difference knowing that Decroy was waiting for him outside the Fifth Valley. Um, soon he was used to it again, and the experiments went on as before. 
So then Christmas break comes and arrangements have been made for him to stay at his uh, uncle Charles's and Aunt Alice's house. And this is where the cousin Caroline that he had pretended he was getting books for actually lives. And he has a really good time. It's just a, another moment of him realizing that life has things that are enjoyable in it. Um, so hanging out with his cousin, even though she's younger than him, and he kind of thought that they would be like, you know, not really have anything to say to each other. It turns out that they get along really well and go out and play and have snowball fights and all kinds of stuff. Um, Christopher enjoyed learning all the things people did in the country, but he was puzzled that no one mentioned Papa. Uncle Charles was Papa's brother. He realized that Papa must be in disgrace with his whole family. In spite of this, Aunt Alice made sure he had a good Christmas, which was kind of her. Oh my God. Is Tacroy his dad? I didn't even think of that. But if he's in disgrace and living somewhere terrible and really doesn't want Chris coming to see him, maybe it's because he's his father and he's just working for Uncle Ralph. But then he warns him in person not to be like too involved with Uncle Ralph. But then why would he even know about any involvement with Uncle Ralph if he weren't to Croy? Because that doesn't seem like something that's being really like bandied about. Maybe, maybe it is. I don't know. But, oh, shit, that's interesting. I wonder, that would be kind of messed up if it turned out that this dude had been his dad the whole time and like they were having some sort of actual relationship just as friends that he wasn't even aware was with his dad. I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, but anyway, so he goes to see the goddess another time and, or this is the time actually that he brings her the second set of books. And, uh, she uses the bracelet because she has led him into like the inner sanctum of the temple as his reward for like coming back again, which he doesn't really think very much of. He doesn't see this as any sort of a reward, but they get caught. There's a, uh, the woman who's sort of in charge of everything can seem to sense where the goddess is anywhere in the temple at any time. So she comes toward them. And the only thing the goddess can think of is to grab off the arm ring again and shove it at him. And that makes him drop back into his bed for a while. Um, so, yeah, this whole thing is just starting to get on his roommate's nerves. They're just like, can you not? Like, come on, dude. Um, so, and, and there's an interesting part as well with the goddess that they, when they go into this inner sanctum, and I liked this a lot. Um, let's see. He was about to turn around because she says, I'd like to see you to see me as I really am. Um, Christopher turned to the goddess, meaning to say, no, you're not. You haven't got four arms. But the goddess was standing in the smoky yellow space with her arms stretched out to the side in the same position as the statue's top pair of arms. And she did indeed have four arms. The lower pair were misty and he could see the yellow curtain through them. But they had the same sort of bracelets and they were arranged just like the statue's lower pair of arms. They were obviously as real as to Croy before he was firmed up. So he looked up at the statue's smooth golden face. He thought it looked hard and cruel behind its blank golden stare. She doesn't look as clever as you, he said. It was the only thing he could think of that was not rude. She's got her very stupid expression on, the goddess said. Don't be fooled by that. She doesn't want people to know how clever she really is. It's a very useful expression. I use it a lot in lessons when Mother of Proudfoot or Mother Dowson go boring on. It was a useful expression, Christopher thought, a good deal better than his vague look which he looked which he used in magic lessons. How do you make it? he asked with great interest. Before the goddess could reply, footsteps padded behind the statue. So yeah, that's kind of a fun thing that I'm hoping he's going to be able to utilize because I need him to figure out that he has magical talent. It's such a shame that he's in these classes and nobody has seemed to think of the fact that the braces are having any sort of effect on him. Um, yeah, or like, I'm I'm wondering if they have been instructed, like, is it possible this didn't even, well, no, that can't be. Because I was going to get really into, like, paranoia and be like, could his uncle 
have instructed somebody to give him braces, the dentist, like, could he have bribed him to do that in order to keep Christopher's magic in check so that he didn't find out how powerful he was. But then he can't travel if his power is dampened and his uncle clearly wants that. So I can't see what he would get out of it unless he also was the one to like get the matron to take his braces off at night, which that starts to feel a little bit too excessive. Like he's got too much of a hand in absolutely everything that happens. And I don't really want that to be true. So I'm just going to say that that's not what's happening here. Um, so it ends with, uh, he admired her quick thinking and he would have liked to learn both the very stupid expression and how you did that vanishing trick with the books, but it was not worth the danger. Um, so I think that's the end of the section that I read here. Yes. Yep. That's the end. So I'm just dying to know exactly when he finds out that he has magical talent, like a real talent of his own, um, and I am also really curious about who Tacroy is. And now I'm like pretty much dead set that Tacroy is his father. And I, I really like, I feel like with the goddess, because I don't remember if she says exactly what happens, but I can't help but wonder if as she starts to get older, she's going to be in danger because they replace them every, you know, once they start to grow out of a certain like youthfulness, I think. Right. And what do they do with the old ones? Do they like retire or are they sacrificed or something? I just kind of like this weird friendship that he has with this person. So I guess we'll have to wait and see what happens there. Um, yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to wrap this up and thank you very much to Patricia for commissioning this. I've just, uh, I actually was low key like waiting on this and I knew that she was having trouble getting spots, but I'm glad that you were able to get some because I wanted to continue on with this. Cause this one is just so much more like uh, the other Diana Wynne Jones books have been a lot more sort of, um, sp the, the stories have been more sprawling and they have not seemed very, uh, like you don't get a great sense of where the story is going right out of the gate. And there are many, many characters involved that you get like occasionally different POVs, but not always, but at least there, there is a strangeness to it that feels like you can't quite nail down exactly what's going on. And in this, I feel like it's a lot more straightforward in a way that I think is what's making it feel so much like comfort food to me. So, yeah, I'm just really interested to see where this goes and if that sort of vibe keeps up or what. I guess we'll find out. So thank you all so much for listening. Hope you've enjoyed the episode and I will be seeing you again soon with a new episode. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.